Hello and welcome to another episode of What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the first world war. I'm Angus Wallace and with me as ever is Jessica Meyer and Chris Kempshaw. Hello. Hello, everybody. Jessica's back after our failed coup last month. Indeed, yes. I, I am not I'm not recording um, other things, which is what I was doing last month. I'm I'm back recording this, which uh, may be less exciting. I don't have to travel into Leeds to do this one. Just sit at my desk. <laughs> so we, we decided for this episode, we're going to be discussing the BBC miniseries 37 Days, which aired in March 2014 as part of the broadcaster's coverage of the centenary of the First World War. Uh, it was shown over three consecutive nights uh, and 37 Days starts with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, then intercut scenes largely between, I assumed it was London and Germany, I don't think they particularly went out of London, uh, in an attempt to lay out the events that lead to the declaration of war by Britain on Germany uh, in 1914. So it aired to rave reviews in Britain. The Times called it a clear and often brilliant dramatisation. The Daily Telegraph described it as enthralling. The Guardian commented impressively wordy and careful reimagining free of romantic digressions or fictional appeals to sentiment. So we've all just watched it or perhaps rewatched it. I missed it first time round. Um, how do we feel about it? Perhaps it should be said, firstly, that I'm not a political or diplomatic historian. Knowing your work, Angus, I don't really think of you particularly as a political or diplomatic historian. And I'm not sure, Chris, do you count yourself as a political or diplomatic historian? You're probably the closest of the three of us. I'm barely a historian. But yeah, perhaps it should be pointed out that we've got three essentially social historians talking about what is a piece of of a pretty hardcore diplomatic history in some ways. Um, this 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 did not look at the little people, even with our our two nice young men narrators in 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 England and and Germany. This this was about you know high diplomacy <laughs> at its highest. So I, I I felt you know I knew the basics, but I I can't say I felt intensely knowledgeable about the details or my ability to to comment on the accuracy to that to that extent, which didn't mean to say I didn't enjoy it. Um, is what I should say. Well, I, I like to imagine the pitch meeting they had at the BBC of, right, we've got the First World War Centenary coming up. Do you know what makes for great drama? Diplomatic communications. <laughs> and and we can do it in three parts because it will be that gripping. Um, and people are going to love it. Everyone loves to know what goes on in the Foreign Office. Um, it's going to be amazing. And I, I think, I, I imagine over the course of this episode, we're going to kind of consider it along two parts. As a piece of drama... I loved it. I loved it in 2014. It's it's a very enjoyable watch, um, and I you know we'll, we'll discuss it as a, as a as a piece of history. But I it's definitely worth watching. It is really good fun. It's very steady. I think is the important thing. A, from a technical point of view, it, it's quite it, it's, it's I don't mean to say slow, but it it, it breathes. <laughs> Put it that way, uh, as the brokerings going around and there's something slightly peculiar uh that i noted it has no music as well so actually that the tension is all in the acting uh there's no sort of big beats of oh my god this has arrived <gasps> um it, th- th- there's no kind of dramatic effects like that and curiously the, another very odd thing i i noticed did you notice that um germany is colored uh blue with a blue hue and britain is a lovely orange and from a set design, did you notice the Germans had telephones more like modern telephones than all the desks? And backward Britain, who has a f- problem at one point in 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 the series, has uh, the old fashioned telephone where you have to hold the receiver thing to your ear and hold the microphone up. So there's, there's a slight thing about modernity in Germany versus the British Foreign Office that has such problems with the with the telephone, um, which uh, you know they're obviously signposting various things throughout the whole thing, but. I actually thought it could have been sped up. I'd have quite liked to have seen it sexed up a bit with a bit more of... Um, <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot what his name. What's Madonna's husband called? Guy Ritchie. It could have been Guy Ritchie-fied. And uh, we could have possibly squeezed in a bit more to to ramp up the tension more. I, I think I think it was missold to the BBC. They should have said, we're going to have a really sexy... There's going to be cables flying everywhere. Get more in it. I mean, the writer claims to have written a 175-page document 
uh, accounting for every phone call, telegram and letter that was sent in that period that he's basing it all on. I'd have liked to have seen all 175 pages in. Like one of the scenes in Harry Potter where all the the, the first Harry Potter film where all the letters are arriving in great speed. Yeah, I I think that would have worked, worked really well. You know, there's this fear that the, the, that the audiences can't cope multiple casts. Oh my good grief, there's too many actors. We don't know what's going on. Clearly we can. We've all watched Game of Thrones and on the whole we've followed a myriad of characters coming and going. I, I, t- I take your point about the stately pace, given that we don't even get a mention of France until halfway through the second episode. And, you know, my knowledge of the outbreak of the war starts with James Joll's The Origins of the First World War, where the first thing you're talking about is the French Secret Service. Um, that's where he starts. I'm going, where the hell is France? Um, but by the end of the second episode, you've got multiple continental European ambassadors all about the same height and all with magnificent facial hair. And it does become quite difficult to tell them apart um, when they're all in a room. And and you, you can hear in the script that they're having to name everybody to make sure that we know which particular country Edward Gray is talking to at this ne- next meeting because they've all, you know, they're all in in Edwardian frock coats with magnificent facial hair. And you can't say, well, we know it's the German ambassador because of his beard or whatever it is. Send in the next identikit ambassador, please. I wonder if that's one reason why they tried to make the Austrian stand out, because he's he's slightly peculiar, sort of ephemerate character. I wonder if they tried to make them all really different. What can we do? I know, let's make him slightly ephemerate compared to the other two, the German and the French guy who are... Who are, you know, the French guy's toweringly Gallic. The French guy also gets the best joke in the entire season, uh, in the entire series, rather, of the when the German ambassador and the French ambassador are waiting outside Edward Gray's office, and the German ambassador awkwardly asks him if he's been waiting long, and he replies, only since 1870. And that is a genuine, bona fide, funny historical First World War joke. Um, that I, it, I laughed in 2014 when I watched it, and I laughed the other day again when I watched it. <laughs> Why do you think France is so slow to appear? It, it is a story about Britain in a way that I'm not sure the origins of the First World War necessarily are. And so they wanted to make it a British and German story. So, and it become, then it becomes difficult because France, France's reasons for going to war are so French and have relatively little to do with Britain. I'm going to let Chris correct me on this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn it over to, to our French specialist at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I agree. I think that it centralises the First World War as, a, as an Anglo-Germanic conflict with everybody else kind of orbiting around them to an extent. And the only way that you can do that is to remove France from the equation. And Jessica is right in that the the French situation and rationale and reasoning for war is not predicated on Britain and its involvement to any great extent at all. And the military planning that goes on between France and Britain kind of has its peaks and troughs in the years leading up to 1914 anyway. I mean, particularly given that Germany declares war on France, France is going to war regardless of what Britain does or not. But if you were to involve the French aspect for it, I mean, I reckon you're adding an extra episode into the series if you do because you're going to have to talk more about 1870 and then you're going to have to talk about French socialists getting gunned down in Parisian cafes and uh, the sacred union and I mean I'm going to love it but I'm going to be like in a very minority of the audience who are going to dig this or or you guy Ritchie it further where you just kind of insert a a scene where um, Edward Grey calls the German ambassador a mug and punches him to the ground and then there's an explosion and then you move into a cockney bar. Uh, Just to bring this slightly up to date have did either of you watch The Pursuit of Love over the last few weeks? weeks on the BBC because because what they did because they that um and of course it, it's semi-autobiographical fiction I suppose um but what Emily Mortimer does with that is to move through time because it starts in sort of 1931 and ends in a decade later um is to use montages of historical images both stills and um uh, silent black and white films at periods of the narrative to show time passing, which were, was quite an interesting one. I'm not sure that would have worked with this series as a way of speeding it up, if, I have to say. I wondered if France got missed out because it doesn't have a monarchy and being a republic, it was the uh, odd dog out. 
you know, because it doesn't fit in the nor- the nar- narrative they have is that is very much it's uh, a ro- the royal family of Europe are all falling out with one another. France doesn't conveniently fit in with being related to them all. Yeah, that's a good point. Particularly the stuff between um, Germany and Russia, that kind of backwards and forwards letters thing is all very much kind of cousins disliking each other. The writer makes the comment that by putting Britain centre stage, the importance of it is that it makes it a world war. Without Britain, it's not a world war. It, I mean, but Britain's empire only um, gets mentioned once in the third episode in regards to the Canadians will do what we tell them to. And all of the, the the kind of the focus of Britain is split between, throughout the episodes, largely on Ireland. And that, I thought, was a really interesting kind of ongoing thread that was was going on but then you know occasional mentions of india and the royal navy and stuff like that but it is very grounded on the continent the the ireland thing i thought was interesting partly because they mention ireland and don't talk about the suffragettes um so they're not talking about the 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 sort of social domestic violence that's going on at this point um but i got the feeling that was very much about the characterization of churchill the irish question becomes the churchill question in some ways in the way it's represented um which i thought was quite interesting injecting churchill in i thought was a a bit of a i made a note that it almost feels you could have it's a similar sort of set of plot points almost to the uh, outbreak of the Second World War, sort of raving dictator, German militarism, British on, on his bro- broker, and Churchill telling everyone what's going to happen uh, and everyone ignoring him. Um, it almost adds to the Churchill myth of uh, if we'd only listened to him, the First World War might never have ha- might never happened, which makes it a slightly unique British uh, interpretation by I- injecting him front and centre. But I think that that stuff about the the, the navy, his his belligerent use of the navy which I don't think he's represent, you know, he doesn't come across as, as being all seeing um, and prescient. And I think that's relatively accurate. Um, and this, this is where I go, I haven't done my political history since I was an undergraduate. I hope I'm remembering this correctly. Um, moments. Certainly I got the sense of, of that, that belligerence and, and the sort of, <laughs> who, who's the, who's the, the cabinet, minister who who says lord morley who says um even a blunderbuss hits uh its target occasionally which that was the joke that made me laugh um I, so i think that felt like the characterization they were going for rather for churchill rather than the prescient um yeah there's a kind of consistent image. saber rattling to to churchill of whether or not he's planning on kind of being belligerent to stop a war or planning on being belligerent to fight in one is a is a break is a kind of a, a, a an area of kind of greyness to him you know he seems to be quite happy to go and deal with the irish question or to kind of be proactive in pursuing whatever he wants it to do in europe and the, and the stuff about the fleet i thought that rang reasonably true um it did sound like something i've once read in the dim and distant past and it's, certainly it chimes with what i know about his approach to gallipoli we should probably also mention that the so. guy who plays Churchill is freakily reminiscent of him. In fact, loads of the, the cast are yeah. really creepily. Lloyd George one in particular looks so much like them, it's unsettling. And the guy who's doing Churchill is doing Churchill's voice without it being a parody. Um, he's not doing an impression of Churchill. He sounds like Winston Churchill. It's weird. We should talk about the cast, incidentally. Um, I mean, this is, this is classic BBC, right, of going who's that actor i know that actor oh my god <laughs> i mean it's just it's everyone in there just, just, just to throw it out there i loved sinead cusack as margot asquith i that just episode one made me entirely happy that that dinner scene they, they, they uh I, I was googling before and i found a tropes website about uh 30, which had a page on 37 days and it had her down as being the trope of the almighty janitor which is in, in a character hierarchy, there's always people at the top, but at the bottom, there's always the janitor who uh, it, 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 it is lowly ranked, but has more idea of what's going on than everybody else. And she's just there, isn't she? Yeah, well, the, but it did make me want to go back and reread her diaries, which again, I haven't read for far too long, because I, I think quite a lot of that dialogue is drawn pretty directly from the diaries. Um which is one of the reasons why that character works so well. It's just a point where I have to be kind of slightly 
dumb and geeky about Ian McDermott. Firstly, I mean, it has to be said that I adore, I will watch Ian McDermott in pretty much anything. Um, and one of the things when we were watching it, we were saying is that he steals every single scene that he's in. It's very hard to look at anything apart from him. However, this was a dual problem for me because obviously Ian McDermott played Palpatine in Star Wars. And a lot of his scenes in the prequel trilogy in Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith is him wandering around being a really genial, charismatic politician. Which means that when watching 37 days later, there are moments of like, oh, um, G German ambassador, let's go and let's go and have a talk and, and I wander around this field. And I'm sat there watching it. Don't go with him. He's a Sith Lord. What are you doing? This is going to end terribly. Don't listen to anything he said. He's evil. Um, except he's not evil. He's Edward Grey. But it's very, very hard not to kind of watch Ian McDermott be Palpatine just in 1914 Britain. But he does such a good job. I'm not convinced at all that Edward Grey is quite the anachronism in this time period that he's portrayed as a, as a very much a man out of his time. I don't believe that he was as kind of naive and Victorian as he's being put across. I think he was a lot savvier than that. But the portrayal and the and the way that the character is presented is it's so good to watch. It's so interesting. Ian McDermott's great. Yeah. Um, although, and this is based entirely, I think, on cartoons of the period. I always think of Edward Grey as being much taller. Um, and the, and the, the the rather heavy handed metaphor of of his eyesight, um, I thought was yeah rather a clunky bit of of characterization there. Um, and more noticeable because I'm not sure there are that many sort of really clunky bits of characterization in this. I, I felt the rather large injection of sporting metaphors on the side of the British was a bit uh, clunky. You know, he's a fly fisherman, yet they, they've, it, all the way through, there's cricket and, you know, there's an idea of British fairness and the sporting mentality that that's all seemed to interject, which I couldn't help but fear was more for the benefit of the viewer to let them think that, that we were on the right side, doing our best and fair play rather than necessarily any form of... Yeah, I, I don't think the telephone thing with him was true either. I'm pretty sure that isn't true. Yeah, I, I wondered how much that was trying to sort of represent the long Edwardian summer, that sort of cultural image. I'm guessing cricket's easier to shoehorn in than uh, taking the German ambassador fly fishing. Um... <laughs> Especially if you want to have a conversation. Yeah. And also, don't go fly fishing with him. He's a Sith Lord. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> oh, we should all be going out and reading his book on fly fishing. Apparently, it's uh, you're still a popular seller. Isn't there a Yellow Pages advert about uh, that? <laughs> I wonder how many people listening, that'll go straight over their heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we all get to feel old. <laughs> I wonder if this is a very top-down approach that they've taken. Um, is this a replay in a slightly more subtle way of that donkey's analogy? You know, it's war, the war's to blame on the upper classes. Uh, and the poor clerks and the people at the bottom didn't have any idea or any agency as to what was happening. I think there's an element of that. Well, I think it, I think that collides at different points of with the portrayal of Germany of a nation that, that is moving rapidly to being very convinced that it acts, you know, it, it wants this and it will pursue this, and that whilst everybody else is trying to kind of you know maintain something resembling stability or the status quo, that element comes into conflict with the nation that doesn't want stability and status quo. Um, so there's an element of the Fritz Fischer about the portrayal of Germany in this, but it's it's not full kind of Fritz Fischer in the sense that, you know, they were they were itching for this, or certainly that various people in the in the German government were itching for this in the lead up to it. So, I mean the von Mulcker is definitely itching for it. The way that I, I kind of then ponder about that is is the appearance of Belgium for Britain and the bit in the cabinet meeting in the third episode where they're talking about Belgium which actually as a as a kind of a thought exercise I would quite consider kind of giving to students in a, in a seminar about you know these are the stakes these are the issues and there's a moral issue there's an ethical issue there's a self-interest issue of if Belgium asks us for help and we say no then what does that make us if we don't help France and they win, then they'll never trust us. If we don't help France and they lose, then Germany will ice be, you know, take over Europe and will be isolated. So that aspect, I think they build towards the kind of the Cats 22 that Britain potentially finds itself in, in very late July, early August in 1914, which 
is an example of the donkeys are basically, you know, the, the situation has run away from everybody. But that cabinet meeting does kind of do a pretty decent job of giving the clarity of these are the selection of very unpleasant choices that we have. So which one do we pick? And I, well, I think there are two things. One, I think if you're going to do a diplomatic history, it's really hard to give voice to the little people um, because it, so is it in episode two where there's the cabinet meeting where the working class minister the trade unionist minister resigns i mean quite clearly he his point in the scene where they're walking out of the cabinet and he's talking to, to edward gray he makes the case for the worker the workers have no voice except the one that he is able to give them so it is you know at this period across Europe, this this is a government of the upper classes, the aristocracy, the upper middle class. There is a Labour Party um, in Britain, um, but it it doesn't it won't have the sort of power that that we think about Labour as having until after the war. And you know, France and Germany are gunning down their socialists in various ways. So we're not talking about a, a political system in which you know the the vast mass of the people yet have a a, a political voice and we we don't even have full enfranchisement in any of these countries so should we start with yeah i i think if, if you're going to take that perspective it's really hard to bring the voice of the masses in um it's always going to be a focus on the the upper classes and i had another point and now i can't remember what it was going to be so i'm going to leave it there <laughs> There's an interesting mention of Keir Hardy at one point. Um, and I liked the bit where, because the, the young British clerk was like, oh, my dad took me to um, see Keir Hardy when I was young. And the the, the, the female typist was like, oh, was your, was your dad a socialist? And the response is, I think you'd have to ask him that. And the question is, he's clearly asking is, are you a socialist? So you get a little bit of the kind of the political stuff in, in tiny snippets, because I'm pretty sure that the German clerk secretly identifies as a socialist as well and he mentioned it very early on in the first episode yeah and he keeps on giving funny looks in in when he's taking notes in cabinet meeting um and some of the more extreme statements uh, just picking up briefly on the female clerks I, I, that i i you know gender historian antenna, antenna alert but i did wonder about that not because i don't think there there weren't female typists in government but i did wonder about there being female typists in the foreign office in particular does anybody know? Um, so that, that that was an interesting, I'd be really interested to know at what point women are, are opening doors. Because what was quite interesting, back to Angus's point about the telephones, you did have this very, very brief moment of a, switch, a male switchboard operator, which of course shifts, the gender of switchboard operators shifts dramatically by the, the 1920s which I assume is because switchboard operators listen in on what's being said on the exchange. So they need to be trusted. And the assumption at this stage being that men are more to be trusted uh, than women with this sort of high level information. But that did make me wonder about, well, would they then have female typists typing up these telegrams and memos? And it was foreign office specific because my sense is that it was much stuffier than other government departments. So... I don't know, um, and and I, I was curious. So, what do we what, what what do we think about the portrayal of Germany? I think they do a good job of showing some of the ongoing kind of political tensions in Germany. The bit with the socialists and the meeting, and there you end up with um, uh, Bethmann and von Bolke making a kind of a a temporary alliance to nullify the threat of socialism. Um, by uniting a war effort, I thought was quite good. The portrayal of the Kaiser is, is kind of, it, it's a difficult one to comment on, because again, I'm not entirely sure, you know, to the extent that he is basically running at like a three-day lag um, and reading newspapers. I, ha I do have memories of having read that, that he was, he was always reacting to yesterday's news. Yeah, I mean, you end up with that element of, as I was saying earlier on, that they're the ones who are pushing for this. They're, you know, there is a, a blame Germany element to, to this, I think, of them being the most belligerent, them the ones telling Austria-Hungary what to do. And Britain, Britain is bungling maintaining the peace, whilst Germany is occasionally bungling, but pushing forward with war. I mean, to an extent, that lets Austria-Hungary quite 
off the you know very a lot off the hook because I you know I, I debate how unaware of what they were doing Austria Hungary is being presented as for this but yeah I think I think Germany is the one that isn't like the others they're the ones who are given the the proactive they're the ones who have the agency to be doing these things and everybody else is reacting to them it's odd though because i hadn't thought of it as you point out the car i, I was going to say the car is relatively unsympathetic he sort of rants and raves and you know my analogy is he's like dr strange love with his uh oh, glove in his hand and he's lifting his arm around and uh rants but actually you're right it, that lag of his information he's going one way and everybody else thinks they're doing the right thing going another which gets us to the First World War when he just wanted a uh, small war with Serbia kind of thing. So, so in some respects, it's, there's a slight sympathy but, uh, of the confusion in Germany of what they're all doing with Molk actually sort of pulling the strings in the background. Even the, the wanting a, a, a small war element of it, there, it's not entirely clear. I don't think, well, I never felt entirely clear about what the Kaiser saw as a benefit of that. You know, whereas France and even Britain, the the motivations for their actions are articulated over and over and over again. It comes across as just pure aggressiveness, even if the intention is only sort of minor, small war with Serbia aggressive, aggressiveness rather than major world conflict aggressiveness. But it, there isn't any other motivation for given for Germany other than to fight a war of whatever scale. Um, and th- and that I think comes across as very blame Germany. Even Russia gets well, let off the hook in that narrative. It's possibly linked to that is that uh, is sort of an idea from a British perspective of nationally stereotyping everyone as well because you have you know the ranting and raving Kaiser, you have the Russian the Tsar who comes across as a bit mad, uh, and of course there's uh, good old King George the Fifth who's calm and measured, which is yeah. Uh, so it's, it's which sort of seemed to fit a, an idea of how the British might want to see the First World War. <laughs> yeah, a, a squabbling um, continent, and we're the only grown-ups in the room, but we've just ever so slightly misjudged things. What a what a tragedy! And 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 slightly slightly at the, um, I mean, this is a pre-Brexit uh, uh, program, right? So the, the ever so slightly a, a, a sense of being dragged in by by the the lies and incompetence of Europe, perhaps. Well, that's a good point. It is a, it is a very different watch post-2016 now, isn't it? I mean, I, I, like Angus, I didn't catch it the first time around. Um, so uh, any any thoughts on changing watching context, Chris? Well, I remember when it came out, I mean, I, to be honest, I remember when it was advertised in 2014, it was like, oh, a shiny First World War programme. And it's got the Emperor from Star Wars in it. It's like the BBC have decided, I've got like, a picture of me on their desk and they've got, you know what, we're going to make a drama series for this guy. Yeah, I enjoyed it. But now, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, that Britain relationship kind of near but not of Europe, you know, occasionally caught up in the affairs of Europe. Yeah, it does take on a different a different tone post-Brexit um, in a, you know, in a way that, you know, became quite familiar in regards to some of the arguments of, of 2016 about, you know, what the, the British role was alongside Europe, but also the idea of a Europe that always leans towards some kind of squabbling chaos and what happens if, you know, the grown-ups aren't in the room is is an interesting interpretation of it, particularly, again, given that the arguments of 2016 and like other, you know, the that the European Union is a peace project and it's designed to prevent Europe descending into into squabbling conflicts. That's why, as a second of it, it would be much more interesting to have France in it because you know the the relation, the modern relationship between Germany and France is the is the relationship that keeps the the peace in in Europe, not so much between um, Britain and Germany. So yeah, that's another kind of reason why it's a slight shame that we don't get to go to Paris at all, both either figuratively or literally. I, you know, we've all been stuck indoors for a while now. Mm. As I think it's just it's just because it's a republic. You can't. It seems to not fit in when you can't link the, the. There's a stress on the royal family all the way through. I, th- I think there's also a really interesting shift because one of the cultural things that that I think we tend to forget at this end of the 20th century is the extent to which, before the First World War, the assumption in Britain more widely wasn't that Germany was the enemy, it was that France was the enemy, because the last Great War had been the Napoleonic Wars. And that, you know, for most of the British population, that's that's 
who, if they fought a European war, I think culturally they would have assumed they would, were going to be fighting for all the German scare, you know, spy narratives that are emerging, the, the German invasion narratives, William Lequeur and, and John Buchan and the rest of it. And part of the reason for that type of literature emerging is because there is a, a, a portion of the uh, cultural elite that, that, that is trying to say, no, you really want to be scared of Germany, not of France. Stop worrying about France. Stop worrying about Germany. So I think, you know, that's that perspective in, the, in this program. We're back to that, something we've talked about in previous episodes of, of seeing the First World War through the lens of our understanding of longer term 20th century history, of seeing Germany as the, the enemy in two world wars. Whereas in the period shown in the 37 day is, I think France would have been seen as more of the enemy than certainly is represented in this, in this program. The other aspect I think that would then hold back uh, France is, if you're going to do a proper examination of French society at this time, you're going to spend a lot of time explaining who all the various factions are and why they hate each other. There is no unity of purpose that you can you can easily sum up as you do in Germany or in Britain or in Austria-Hungary or anywhere like that um, until the threat of war becomes so clear and so present that you get the sacred union. Because otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time in France going, OK, here are socialists and Dreyfusards and Catholics and a few lingering Bonapartists and the like. And God, they would just love to stab each other to death. But oh, look, a German has arrived. Um, and, you know, as fun as that would be, um, it's going to just take up so much time. But I think Jessica's point about, I mean, particularly that kind of weird invasion literature over the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Certainly in the British government, there's no cons- you know, particular fear about France, particularly not once the military planning has been undergoing after kind of Morocco and Agadir and the like. But I mean, definitely at the end of the of the the nineteenth century, when you end up with like the Fashoda crisis and the like, um, uh, playing out at the same time as the as the Dreyfus affair, um, where France is. I mean, the French Prime Minister, um, after confronting the the British during the Fashoda crisis, declares that we've acted like madmen in France and that we've nearly brought the might of the British Empire down upon us in a time when we can't possibly hope to defend ourselves. It's only kind of the ongoing emergence of of Germany, but how much that actually transfers into the kind of British civilian population as a, as a replacement for, you know, the French placeholder, which, I mean, to be honest, it still kind of exists today. The idea that, you know, the French are not to be trusted and they're the old people that we've always been fighting and, you know, the Germans are a 20th century problem. So, yeah, how much the kind of the, the British population at the time in, you know, 1913 or so is desperately concerned about Germany as opposed to France? I mean, they get on board with it in the end, but, you know, there's going to be a, there's going to be a swing well, there is that docu- There is that discussion in the cabinet meeting, isn't there, on how they're going to spin any war, isn't there? Which I thought was interesting. It, 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 um, they're going to uh, use Belgium as the uh, Casus Belli to sort of sell the war to the British public, and then instantly you get in your head that kind of um, "Remember Belgium" poster. But 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 that takes us actually back to one of the the sort of interesting debates in the historiography, and. Actually, my, the point that I forgot earlier um, in relation to your question, Angus, about is this a rehash of lions led by donkeys? I think one of the things to bear in mind in the lions led by donkeys debate is the extent to which that in part comes out of a debate in Britain about whose fault is the war? Is it the politicians or is it the generals? And and this is a program, that a, a dramatization that's looking just at the politicians in the British context, yes, we have Prussian militarism, which means you get the German military represented in, in Malka. But we don't really get all the post haldane debates. Um, there's that one mention of you get the Tories and you'll get conscription, which didn't quite ring true to me. What that leaves out is the political manoeuvring using the press using the media um, and the, pre- the pe- press barons to to negotiate that establishment relationship, and that doesn't come into this at all. Now, part that may be because I'm not sure it starts to play out until 1915 onwards. Although you know it, it's all been set up, but the the lack of the military in the British establishment is actually an interesting omission from this program. You know, thought Kitchener would have turned up at some point. 
um, in some way, shape or form, would have become a an appearing figure. He's in Egypt. He comes back from Egypt to get his... He gets some title, doesn't he? But it's literally just before the First World War. Well, this is literally just before the First World War. It's 37 days to the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but... Because I think he, he was due to return to Egypt, wasn't he? As the uh, but even you know even with all the all the naval stuff and and we're back to Churchill and and Churchill's aggression, you you sort of never realise that there is there is a military a, a naval establishment other than the the personification of Churchill as the navy, which is an extraordinary. <laughs> characterization there's a discussion at one point about sending two divisions to france isn't there um comes up yeah they very briefly mention uh, uh the british expeditionary force and i think uh, edward grace was oh i don't think it, i don't think we need to talk about that it's not going to come to that i wonder if does does this airing on the bbc um I, 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 I give some sort of authenticity to this um which uh, um, Mark Hayhurst describes, he points out that um, other versions, because because of when they say aired, there's so much other First World War got things going on, it means that an accurate version could be forcibly sidelined. And then he could, refers to uh, the Liberty Valence syndrome of when in doubt, print the legend. Now, does this fall into that trap of printing the legend with, with official backing of the BBC? Because I think... I think it does produce a, an accepted national narrative because it's the BBC and because it's designed to go out just before the start and centenary and the like. But uh, me and Jessica spent, uh, I mean, obviously you've got Mark Hayhurst who's done the writing in that point because me and Jessica spent a reasonable amount of time yesterday trying to see if we could find out who the historical advisors were to try and kind of trace the providence of some of it. And we couldn't come up with anything. So it seems to be entirely that it's come from like Mark Hayhurst and the, and the various writers um, and like certainly nobody that we found has you know come forward and gone you know I was uh, consultant on this or similar, but I do think I think if it goes out on ITV or some or similar it it jumps the fence of historical drama into drama. I think it it gets viewed as being more fictional. Um, going out on the BBC I think gives it gravitas. And there is that you know BBC character actor cast, which I think. Yes, it fits into a a genre in a way that it wouldn't on another channel. I guess we're watching it in isolation. Um, We might find that the following night was a one hour documentary that uh, picked the whole lot together in a slightly different form. Well, did it go out on BBC One or BBC Two? I think it went out on BBC One. Okay. Um, because I do remember it coming out at about the same time as Parade's End, which is my hands down favorite uh, bit of cultural production from that centenary year. Um, that was brilliant. I think it might have come up against Parade's End on BBC One, which is an interesting bit of scheduling. And it was much earlier in the year. It was March. I thought it came, I thought it was shown in August, literally just before the centenary was, so, was due to start. It was. It was. It was uh, bookended by the Hairy Bikers and Rod Gilbert's work experience uh, on the first night, and the second night was Gardner's World and QI. God, the internet's great at this fans, and it finished on a Saturday night. Um, and it so it, it, it was done. It was done three consecutive nights rather than yep. on yep. a weekly basis. Perfect, Malcolm Wise and Lee Stewart's comedy vehicle. So they didn't pack it round anything to add anything to it. And I don't know if there's anything on the Sunday night that followed it up. No, there's nothing the following Sunday to sort of immediately follow it up with any explanation. So it is sat there. Um, as a, 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 on its own with no extra explanation needed. Even going three consecutive days kind of, you know, it, it might just be a scheduling decision, but it suggests a kind of a, there's no delay. It suggests a building momentum or a kind of a, uh, you know, the stone is rolling type situation where you go from one day straight to the next, straight to the next, and then you're at war um, rather than, you know, taking it a week at a time and breaking it up um, does kind of give it a, an inertia in the middle of the schedule. I did think it's interesting his point about uh, you you can't go against the perceived popular history um otherwise it disappears because 
there's a, a some documentary that comes out that seems to have disappeared that actually challenged a lot of the British perceptions of the Somme and that never gets a mention. I mean, I, uh, I always find it interesting, and this is a wider thing, um, which is why I'm not a diplomatic historian, that, you know, the, the fact that we can have multiple blockbusters, blockbuster histories with competing, there are so many competing versions of why Europe went to war in some ways. Um, and this was right when the Sleepwalkers was coming out, wasn't it? When it was really popular. So, <sighs> So I think it's harder to, to, to talk about the mythification of this particular period just because the historiography is a popular – it's one of the few historiographic debates that is a genuinely popular history for reasons that I, I – as I say, I don't quite understand, but that, that, those are my historical biases <laughs> – it did feel like it chimed with my memory of doing the origins of the First World War as an undergraduate. So to that extent, yes, building on sort of popular knowledge. But I do, I do wonder, given the number of sort of big histories of, of how Europe went to war, if we can say there is a, a sort of popular myth of the origins of the war. Does it reinforce the, uh, or does it nuance the perceived British perceived idea that Germany started and it actually just uh, adds more context to how we got there. It might do. I mean, it's kind of hark back to one of our recent episodes when we were talking about um, computer games. One of the things that I've talked about previously before in regard to that kind of media depiction of the war is that computer games are terrible at explaining why the war happens and what it's for to the extent that they tie it, it, those that attempt to tie themselves up in knots so they just ignore it. You know, the first war is a thing that happened. It's it doesn't matter what it was for. It doesn't matter why it started. It is an an event, and I wonder how much that exists within the the kind of the the popular consciousness as well. Because computer games are also terrible at explaining why the war ends in the way that it does, and why the war ends when it does. And I don't think we've got any closer to, to a popular public understanding about why the war ends in 1918 that isn't based around the fact that everybody's quite tired. And going into the you know the details is all just varying degrees of, of bloody battles and the like but yeah the kind of the bookmarks of the, of the first world war exist in a weird kind of semi-remembered but not particularly important space um and things like the sleepwalkers have definitely filled a fair bit of that of the idea that you know it was a it was an accident nobody realized what was happening and then everyone falls down the stairs and there's a fight at the bottom of it as opposed to the fisher it was all germany's fault approach i was a little disappointed that there wasn't a sequel called six months in paris set in 1919 again in regards to you know gripping um dramatizations of everybody sat in woodrow wilson's office um with the italians stuck out on the sidelines because no one would, thinks they're important you would you would have had to have had going back to one of our another of our earlier episodes you have had to have lawrence varabia there in his wonderful uh robes which are now at the australian um you know the just because that that's the visual image that everybody remembers of Paris, isn't it? That and, and the Hall of Mirrors. I would watch the hell. I mean, again, I'm very much speaking for an incredibly niche audience, but a, a dramatisation of like Margaret Macmillan's The Peacemaker's book or something like that would be tremendous fun. Yes. Well, there we go. Maybe we can just hope that one of our listeners is a commissioning editor for the BBC. And, uh... Yeah, and if you want three semi... <laughs> Expert. <laughs> Expert historians <laughs> who can speak... Busket. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> We've read Margaret Macmillan as well. Uh, you could sell it on the what, what, why we, how we got to where we are now kind of thing rather than, uh, you know, why you could, yeah, spin it off of something else. So as we start to drift, is there anything, anything we'd like to add to 37 Days? If you haven't watched it, I think the audience should go out and watch it. Um, you know, approach it in whichever way you want to approach it. But I have watched... I mean, I imagine we all have. I mean, certainly doing the, the podcast, we've been kind of watching all sorts of popular culture representations of the First World War. And it is an enjoyable watch. It is it is fun. It is interesting. Um, so it is worth a watch. Um, if, if nothing else, the cast is just extraordinary. I did, a, a, a small tidbit I picked up from uh, the internet. The Germans are all played by... German actors putting on English German accents. Oh, I'd have loved to have sat in on those auditions. 
speak normally. No, no, not like that. <laughs> and, and then uh, it was on again. It was on democracy, open democracy. Don't know. And then they point out that actually the Kaiser didn't have a German accent. He spoke with perfect English. Oh, I didn't know that. And and I, and I think I think the the um the Russian emperor spoke with a French accent, if I recall correctly. It, it, interested national stereotyping. God, it was a mess, to, wasn't it? Uh, signpost things for the viewer. <laughs> all, all the all the German uh, it, it was all the German military officers with their shaved heads. So uh, where are we next time, Chris? I think we're down to with two possibilities, haven't we? We've got two possibilities. We might be talking to Helen Brook about um, dram- drama and theatre and the First World War, and we might be talking to friends of the podcast uh, Emma Hanna about oh. music and the First World War, but we don't know which will be which yet. Because that's a future. Yes, 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 yes. I'm looking forward to the music. I need, I need to pick up the Emma's music book and uh, read it. Very excited about that. I'm just saying, it, it, when we talk to Emma, because we will talk to Emma eventually. If it's not next month, it'll be the month after. Hopefully, um, we need to get lots of music clips in there. Um, oh yeah, we do. Probably not of us singing them though, because nobody wants that. No, no. But Ivor Novello singing that would be, would be fun. fun. That sounds much that. better. <laughs> that stuff's out of copyright, surely. Yes, yes, I think it definitely is. I'm sure if you're using it from some rackety old 78, no one will ever get picked picked up on. Anyway. Right, so until next time, it's nice to see you all. Nice to see everybody. We'll see, nice to see you too. See you again soon. Bye. 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 Oh, 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 it's a lovely war.